Welcome back to our channel. Today we are set to highlight the rise of the world's most powerful drug cartel. But before that, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you will be notified anytime we upload an amazing video. The Medellin cartel was a powerful and highly organized Colombian drug cartel and a criminal organization originating in the city of Medellin, Colombia that was founded and led by Pablo Escobar. It is often considered the first major drug cartel and was referred to as such, a cartel due to the organization's upper echelons being built on a partnership between multiple Colombian traffickers operating alongside Escobar. The cartel was loosely organized and informal or spontaneous in its operational style in comparison to other groups like the Cali cartel. At the height of its power, the Medellin cartel made roughly $100 million in drug profits a day. They supplied 96% of the United States cocaine and controlled 90% of the global cocaine market. The cartel differed from its smaller counterparts in that it was highly organized, highly influential, and capable of corrupting almost anyone. For just under 20 years, the cartel effectively took over Colombia. Included were Jorge Luis Ochoa Vasquez, Juan David Ochoa Vasquez, Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Garcha and Carlos Leda. The cartel operated from 1972 to 1993 in Bolivia, Colombia, Panama, Central America, Peru, the, the Bahamas United States, which included cities such as Los Angeles and Miami, as well as in Canada. Although the organization started as a smuggling network in the early 1970s, it wasn't until 1976 that the organization turned to traffic cocaine. This was a result of Escobar getting introduced to the lucrative idea of cocaine smuggling by fellow Colombian trafficker Griselda Blanco. Although notorious for once dominating the illegal cocaine trade, the organization, particularly in its later years was also noted for its use of violence for political aims and its asymmetric war against the Colombian government, primarily in the form of bombings, kidnappings, indiscriminate murder of law enforcement and political assassination. Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria. Haciendo negocios, así que pues fresco. Ustedes eligen plata o plomo. At its height, the Medellin cartel was the largest drug cartel in the world and smuggled three times as much cocaine as its main competitor, the Cali Cartel, an international drug trafficking organization based in the Vale del Corca Department of Colombia. At this time, the Medellin Cartel was generating over $20 billion annually. In the late 1970s, the illegal cocaine trade became a significant problem for law enforcement and became a major source of profit for criminals, particularly smugglers. Drug Lord Pablo Escobar protected other smugglers who partnered with him and distributed cocaine for the cartel in New York City and later Miami, establishing a crime network that, at its height, trafficked around 300 kilos per day. During the cartel's zenith, Escobar oversaw the import of large shipments of coca paste from Andean nations such as Peru and Bolivia into Colombia, where it was then processed into cocaine hydrochloride in jungle labs before being flown into the United States in amounts of up to 15 tons per day. In 1973, there was a military coup in Chile which led to a strong crackdown on Chilean drug traffickers. This caused drug traffickers to have to use different routes, around the same time, the prevalence and social acceptance of contraband in Colombia were at an all-time high. In conjunction, these two points helped spark the creation of the Medellin Cartel in 1972. The Medellin Cartel's most famous member is probably Pablo Escobar. Known as the King of Cocaine, Escobar was also the wealthiest criminal in history. By 1982, cocaine surpassed coffee as the chief Colombian export. Around this time in the early 1980s, kidnappings made by guerrilla groups led the state to collaborate with criminal groups like those formed by Escobar and the Ochoa. 
the abduction of Carlos Leda as well as the 1981 kidnapping of the sister of the Ochoas led to the creation of cartel-funded private armies that were created to fight off guerrillas who were trying to either redistribute their lands to local peasants, kidnap them, or extort the grammage money that the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, Fuerzas Armadas revolutionaries to Colombia or FARC attempted to steal. Following this time in the mid-80s, Escobar's hold on Medellin further increased when he founded a criminal debt collection service known as the Oficina de Envigado. This was an office in the town hall of Envigado, a small municipality next to Medellin where Escobar grew up. Escobar used the municipal office to collect debts owed to him by drug traffickers and set the sicarios or hired killers on those who refused. Escobar was known to flaunt his wealth and went on to make Forbes billionaires list for seven years straight, between 1987 and 1993. Escobar was known for investing profits from the drug trade in luxury goods, property, and works of art. He is also reported to have stashed his cash in hidden coves, allegedly burying it on his farms and under floors in many of his houses. Once U.S. authorities were made aware of questionable activities, the group was put under Federal Drug Task Force surveillance. Evidence was gathered, compiled, and presented to a grand jury, resulting in indictments, arrests, and prison sentences for those convicted in the United States. However, very few Colombian cartel leaders were taken into custody as a result of these operations. Mostly, non-Colombians conspiring with the cartel were the fruits of these indictments in the United States. Most Colombians targeted, as well as those named in such indictments, lived and stayed in Colombia, or fled before indictments were unsealed. However, by 1993 most, if not all, cartel fugitives had been either imprisoned or located and shot dead, by the Colombian National Police trained and assisted by specialized military units and the CIA. The last of Escobar's lieutenants to be assassinated was Juan Diego Arcila Renau, who had been released from a Colombian prison in 2002 and hidden in Venezuela to avoid the vengeance of Los Pepes. However, he was shot and killed in his Jeep Cherokee as he exited the parking area of his home in Cumana, Venezuela, in April 2007. Perhaps the greatest threat posed to the Medellin cartel and the other traffickers was the implementation of an extradition treaty between the United States and Colombia. It allowed Colombia to extradite to the US any Colombian suspected of drug trafficking and to be tried there for their crimes. This was a major problem for the cartel since the drug traffickers had little access to their local power and influence in the US, and a trial there would most likely lead to imprisonment. Among the staunch supporters of the extradition treaty were Colombian Justice Minister Rodrigo Lara, who was pushing for more action against the drug cartels, police officer Jamie Ramirez, and numerous Colombian Supreme Court judges. However, the cartel applied a bend-or-break strategy towards several of these supporters, using bribery, extortion, or violence. Nevertheless, when police efforts began to cause major losses, some of the major drug lords themselves were temporarily pushed out of Colombia, forcing them into hiding from which they ordered cartel members to take out key supporters of the extradition treaty. The cartel issued death threats to the Supreme Court judges, asking them to denounce the extradition treaty. The warnings were ignored. This led Escobar and the group he called Los Extraditables, the Extraditables, to start a violent campaign to pressure the Colombian government by committing a series of kidnappings, murders, and narco-terrorist actions. In November 1985, 35 heavily armed members of the M-19 guerrilla group stormed the Colombian Supreme Court in Bogota, leading to the Palace of Justice siege. Some claimed at the time that the cartel's influence was behind the M-19's raid, because of its interest in intimidating the Supreme Court. Others state that the alleged cartel guerrilla relationship was unlikely to occur at the time because the two organizations had been having several standoffs and confrontations, like the kidnappings by M-19 of drug lord Carlos Leda and of Marta Nieves Ochoa, the sister of Juan David Ochoa. These kidnappings led to the creation of the M.A.S.A. paramilitary group by Pablo Escobar. As a means of intimidation, the cartel conducted thousands of assassinations throughout the country. 
Escobar and his associates clarified that whoever stood against them would risk being killed along with their families. Some estimates put the total around 3,500 killed during the height of the cartel's activities in Medellin. In 1993, shortly before Escobar's death, the cartel lieutenants were also targeted by the vigilante group Los Pepes, or Pepes, people persecuted by Pablo Escobar. With the assassination of Juan Diego Arcilla Enao in 2007, most if not all of Escobar's lieutenants who were not in prison had been killed by the Colombian National Police Search Bloc, trained and assisted by the U.S. Delta Force and CIA operatives, or by the Los Pepes vigilantes. DEA agents considered that their four-pronged kingpin strategy, specifically targeting senior cartel figures, was a major contributing factor to the collapse of the organization. La Oficina de Envigado is believed to be a partial successor to the Medellin organization. Don Berna founded it as an enforcement wing for the Medellin cartel. When Don Berna fell out with Escobar, La Oficina caused Escobar's rivals to oust Escobar. The organization then inherited the Medellin turf and its criminal connections in the US, Mexico, and the UK, and began to affiliate with the paramilitary United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, organizing drug trafficking operations on their behalf.